7,500 miles from the coast of California, the group of 7,100 islands forming the Philippine archipelago under the protectorate of the United States government. And as part of this group is the island of Bolo, also under the protectorate of the United States government, but the actual regional ruler is the Sultan of Sulu, head of the Mohammedan faith of the Sulu archipelago and Borneo. Although Holo is but 500 miles from Manila as the crow flies, it is 500 years and even more behind the march of time. The Chinese pier, built on the fever-infested mudflat, and the squalid, the odious Nipa shacks of the native motto, seemed hardly the background for romance. The Moro has refused the advances of civilization, and although living under the American flag, spurns its protection. He is never without his deadly barong, boro, or chris, long, broad, razor-edged blade, of Damascus steel, forged in their blacksmith shops, just as they were centuries ago. The man who keeps the home fires burning with the same bellows his ancestors used. And here's a keen fellow. He puts a fine edge on the whole business. See the point? The betel nut is the native chowder. This betel nut uh, eater answering the call to mess. And what a mess. The great white way of Holo. The marketplace, a native grover scene and the smell of stale fish drove us out. Benita, the girl in our story, is the daughter of the Datu Tamboyan, a staunch Mohammedan and member of the Sultan's household. Benita, unknown to her father, has given her heart to Asa, an unbeliever. The Pangs and Hang Falls was the trysting place of Benita and Asa, who must keep their love a secret. For were it known to her people that Benita had yearned her heart with an infidel, it would mean certain death to both of them. Asan came from the native isle of Siasi, traveling the rapids to the pool at the foot of the fall. Porcupine fish, a very ugly fellow, but he has his good point. The seahorse, to ride it, one must wear a fish suit, a sort of uh, riding halibut.
It has been truly written. Love knows no hidden path. To Tamboyan came the Datu Dekor, also a Moro chieftain, seeking the hand of Benita, not as wife number one, but possibly as number one wife in his harem of many wives. They drink a toast, non-alcoholic, by the way. The Koran forbids alcohol. Yes, I know you're wondering how that cocktail shaker got there. It was picked up by the Datu Tamboyan on one of his many visits to Manila. The old boy had his moment. Benita is introduced to her future husband, who creases her forehead. This is a morrow's substitute for a kiss. They can have it. Benita senses that her fate has already been determined between her father and the Datu Adekar. Her father tells her he has made up her mind that she is to become one of the wives of the Datu Adekar. Benita is stunned. She cannot even hope that Arson, though he would brave the wrath of the Moros in an alliance with her, would be acceptable by her people. His paganism is an insurmountable bar. Father commands, and she must obey. Anger, then rage with the realization that she was to be forced into marriage and as one of many wives. Then anger and rage give way to the sobs of a broken heart. Philippa, her maid and companion, tries to comfort her without avail. Her love is arson. Without him, there is no love. Without love, there is no life. While arson, unmindful of the tragedy being enacted, pursued his occupation as a pearl diver. An occupation that often gets him into deep water. But Hassan knows his business. He started at the bottom and uh, worked his way up to the top. Just a shell game. Pearl fishing is the main commercial effort of the morrow. The perfectly matched pearls of the world come from the bottom of the Sulu Sea. And Arsen hopes to recover a gem as his dowry to Benita. To touch his master's hand and rub his nose upon it is to the servant an act of veneration and transfers to him some of the nobility and holiness believed to be ever present in the body of a Datu. The servants of the Datu Tamboyan are commanded to spread the glad tidings of the betrothal of his daughter to the Datu Dekor. Benita tells Arsen of her forthcoming marriage. He pleads with her not to sacrifice their love and future happiness to uphold an old tradition. Benita, dutiful daughter that she is, 
tells Arson that she must abide by the wishes of her father and hold fast to the faith of her people. Arson pleads. Nothing must stand in the way of their wonderful love. She must flee with him to his people and his father's protection. Benita, following the dictates of her heart, agrees. Plans are made for the elopement. Arsene will call for her before the date set for her marriage to the Datu Decor. On the way to the ceremonial, where a good time will be had by all, singing, dancing, and fish. denotes a home of mourning. The boys aren't very far behind the girl. Ain't it the truth? To us, the ceremonial dances of the morrow may seem silly and fashionable, but to the morrow it is sacred. Each dance, each step, has its meaning. Here we have the dance of the guardian of good and the spirit of evil, really a combat to influences that may hover over the bride and groom-to-be. The spirit of evil must be conquered. He always is. It's a fixed fight. Mother says, Kumbosagi, meaning get an eyeful baby because someday you may have to go to the match yourself, or words to that effect. The Dance of Happiness. If this was the karaoke, I'd say the one on the right was Carrie. That boy sure shakes a wicked instep. The dance goes on to the music of the Gabon. Every little movement has a meaning all its own. The musicians will play and the dancers will dance until they all drop from exhaustion to ensure the future happiness of the bride and groom. for Benita. Nimble feet make nimble dancers. Therefore, the youngsters start at an early age to make the foot muscles limber. This makes them good dancers and, incidentally, improves their understanding.
The celebration has started soon as had expected, and he hurries to keep his tryst with Benita. Step on the gas, Asan. An important part of the ceremony is the dance of death. In reality, a battle. One of the combatants represents an unbeliever, and the other fights for Allah and Muhammad, his prophet. No one knows which is which until after the fight. The combat is presided over by a visiting Datu. These fights are deadly affairs. In every instance, one of the fighters are killed. He then is declared the unbeliever. One of the disciples of Muhammad draws his polo and in his fanatic of frenzy really believes he is fighting an unbeliever and is on the point of dealing the death thrust but is prevented in this instance by the Datu due to the fact that Americans, white men, our staff and cameramen were present and to allow a murder to be committed let alone photograph, would land him in pretty hot water with the United States government. The season of the typhoon has started. An evil omen. Asan, on his way to Benita, learns that the preliminary ceremony was about to end, and the wedding of Benita and the Datu Dekar will take place on the morrow. Another feature of the celebration, the Battle of the Caribou. Again, to keep alive their religious fanaticism, one caribou represents the believer and the other the unbeliever. And again, no one knows who is who until the fight is over. Of course, the caribou don't know this, but being bull-headed creatures, they are always ready to horn in on a fight. The caribou are held by ropes to prevent them from running away. And as they circle around, the boys holding them get the thrill of a merry-go-round ride, minus the brass ring. The palace of the Datu Tamboyan was the only stone structure on the island and rivaled even that of the Sultan of Sulu. Planned and built by a missionary, formerly a Spanish architect, whose life was saved by Datu Tamboyan when he, the missionary, had unknowingly entered a mosque, the worst offense an unbeliever can commit. Asan, through circumstances rather than by design, calls to take Benita with him at the only hour when discovery is less likely, the siesta hour. The Nita is torn between love and duty. Asan beseeches her not to fail him. Though her love for her father is strong, her love for Asan is stronger. She will go with him.
all would have been well had they not been observed by a little coconut thief. While Arson was trying to steal Benita, he was trying to steal coconuts. What can this be? The boy is puzzled. He's in a quandary. In fact, you will notice he's up a tree. Something is amiss. He must spread the alarm. and the natives hastened to answer. It wasn't long before the terrible news that Benita had run off with an unbeliever had spread throughout the island. The only horse on the island, and when he goes the way of all horse flesh, the chances are there will never be another. Datu Dekor was first to hear of the elopement and imparts the astounding news to Benita's father and with vengeance in his heart demands the blood of Asa. Natives answer the Datu Tomboyan's command to unfurl every vintage sail, to search every island until the elopers are caught and the unbeliever brought back to be sacrificed. Faithful are called to the mosque to Allah and Muhammad, his prophet, to of the infidel. And soon the walls of the mosque resound with their cry for vengeance. Capture seems imminent, and all their plans for the future so hopeless. Arson lands on one of the many uninhabitable islands 
in an effort to outwit the pursuers. group of bitters has spied them. Their one chance for safety lies in the heart of the jungle. At that moment, a swarm of screeching bats appeared, a sure omen of impending evil. Hemmed in on every side, Arson seeks refuge in a giant tree in the hope of eluding pursuers. An unforeseen enemy in the form of a python. Not that the fangs of a python are poisonous or can even inflict a mortal wound, but to be caught and entangled in its coils means to be crushed to death.
To the captors, this is a Roman holiday. It isn't often they are privileged to capture and taunt an unbeliever. Hassan had little hope that his life would be spared. He was resigned to whatever fate awaited him. But he tells the Datu Tamboyan that he loves his daughter, and if he will give her to him in marriage, he will embrace the faith of Muhammad and together with Benita, devote his life to her people. The Datu Dekor in his hatred and anger calls Benita an unspeakable name. He tells the Datu Tamboyan he will have naught to do with his daughter. She has been defiled by the touch of a pagan. He wouldn't have her in his harem at any price. With Arsam embracing the faith of Muhammad and the Datu Dekor spurning Benita, there is nothing left for her father to do but to consent to Benita's marriage to Arsam. signifies his acceptance of the customs of the moral Mohammedan by taking a whiff of beneath his father's hand. What a man, he fears nothing. came the day of days, their wedding. You will note the absence of the grotesque facial mud pack. The custom of smearing the face with paint is not followed when the bridal couple are of high caste. A manicurist's dream come true. Benita's going to nail arson at any cost. This is a tricky moment. According to the moral Mohammedan ritual, if Arsene so much as touches the hem of the garment of another woman on his way to Benita, that woman will take Benita's place as the bride. Three times is Benita turned around on a pillow to signify she will obey the word of her new lord and master. This is the turning point in her life. And so we leave them in Holo, 500 miles from Manila as the crow flies. 
500 years behind the march of time. Everything different except love. As has been truly written, love knows no hidden past.